Yes. So first of all, I have just some introductory remarks, which are thank yous. I want to thank the entire BCRW staff, including, of course, Pramila Hope Dector, Olivia Cummings, Pamela Phillips, uh, Sandra Moyano, Aritza, Sophie Kreitzberg, and Kelsey Kitsky. I want to thank Barnard Facilities, which does the setup for these rooms and the cleanup afterwards, and um, has been, in one way, BCRW's longest standing partner at, at Barnard College. Um, and then IMATS and AV Services, um, who also make these events possible, and in particular make it possible for them to appear on the BCRW YouTube page after the event itself. So it's so wonderful to have all of you in the room, and then we hope that you will be able to use this material in your teaching, in your learning, share it with friends and the like afterwards. So thank you to IMATS and AV. Um, I do want to um, acknowledge the land on which we find ourselves. Um, I would like to acknowledge that the land on which this campus has been built um, is part of the traditional and unceded territory of the Lenape people of the Delaware Nation. The Lenape were displaced from their homelands to places as far as what is now Oklahoma, Wisconsin, and Ontario, Canada. We respect indigenous peoples past, present, and future and uplift their continuing presence on their homelands. We also acknowledge the legacy of forced enslavement, um, displacement, and genocide of African people from their homelands. We understand that our existence on this campus this evening, using the resources of this institution, has been enabled by a history of both land and labor extraction. Um, I do want to note um, uh, that we do have uh, books by our speakers available this evening for uh, reasons that I won't go into. Uh, we are not able to sell them tonight, so we're giving them away. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, well, maybe, maybe I will say the college variously present, prevented us from, se from selling them, so we're like, okay, we're giving them away. That said, though, we have only, we have three speakers and 30 books, so we have 10 of each speaker's book, so please only take one um, uh, copy of the books. Uh, to your favorite charity. Right, yeah, or, or to BCRW, um, but yes, or, or to, you know, to the booksellers themselves, whatever. We believe that you should read more about it, funny thing at a college, um, so um, please um, do, we, we, we expect they'll go fast, but please do take the books home with you. Um, so it is now my turn to um, introduce the speakers themselves. Um, each of our two guest speakers will uh, speak, do brief remarks from the podium, and then our colleague Anupama Rao will uh, lead a discussion with our speakers, and which we hope all of you would, will join. So when, because the event is being recorded, when we move into the audience uh, discussion of the evening, even though it's a small room, we will ask you to use microphones so that the people who um, are watching the video later will be able to hear what your questions are. Um, so, um, we decided to speak in alphabetical order by last names. Um, so, first will be Gwatra Bahadur, who is an associate professor of journalism and English at Rutgers University, Newark. Um, her book, Cooley Woman, is a personal history of indenture. And it is a very important book that has won many prizes. So, although the, the bio is short, it's very impressive right off the bat. It was shortlisted for the Orwell Prize, the British Literary Award, um, and the British Literary Award for Artful Political Writing. And for anyone who does political writing, you know that artful political writing is unusual and we're very lucky to have her here with us this evening. Um, Yashika Dutt is the award-winning author of Coming Out as Dalit, which is an international, and, and is an internationally acclaimed journalist and one of the world's leading feminist voices on cast. Having been instrumental in shaping the text of Seattle's anti-caste bill, coming out, as Dalit, Dutt's first, it, coming out as Dalit is a bestseller and currently part of the curriculum in over 50 colleges and universities worldwide, including Harvard, Berkeley, and UC Davis. She recently finished working on a revised version of Coming Out as Dalit, which will be published by Beacon Press in February of 2024. And then our uh, moderator for this evening is our colleague in the history department, Anupama Rao. And I do want to say just a few personal words about um, Anu before reading her uh, bio. Um, two things which are important. One of the reasons we're particularly um, happy to have this event this evening as our annual Helen Pond McIntyre event is because, as you know, Barnard and Columbia have just added cast to their anti-discrimination mm -hmm. school. And one of the things that we at BCRW are committed to is the idea 
that knowledge, uh, reading, writing, um, is connected to action, and Anu has been, I think, one of the leaders on this campus, um, you know, since I have uh, known her. She came shortly after I came, um, and I was uh, talking with her right before we started about some important events that um, Anu sponsored right from the moment that she appeared on campus as a junior faculty member, um, including one in 2002 that was addressing, you know, violence in the state of India that was, at that moment, uh, uh, particularly a flashpoint for um, uh, conversation both uh, about what had happened in India and also in um, New York. And it was a moment in which Anu was willing to say, I will, as a junior faculty member, um, be the lead person to make this knowledge available to our students at Barnard and Columbia. And that just feels like a very important history that has led now to this change in the anti-discrimination statement. But I will say that it has been an honor to be her colleague these many years. Okay, now for the official stuff about Anu. She is professor of history, thank you. By the way, back to thank you, as I mentioned, we uh, will have, and then I'll read official Anu, um, uh, that we have uh, body language productions as ASL interpreters here this evening. Uh, we try to make our events accessible uh, universally, um, and this is also particularly helpful for people who um, watch the video, and the videos will also be captioned as well as um, uh, including the interpretation into ASL. All right. Anu Palmer Rao is professor of history here at Barnard and Misas at Columbia University. She is director of the Institute for Comparative Literature and Society at Columbia and has spent over nine years as senior editor of comparative studies in South Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. She is the author of The Cast Question, a book of social and intellectual history, which has received critical acclaim for transforming the field's understanding, and I would say our institution's understanding of the relationship between caste and democracy and for its contributions to political thought and history more broadly. So we will hear from all of our speakers and then have open conversation. So go ahead to it. Oh, I guess you're coming up here. Hello, good evening everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, and thanks to the Barnard Center for Research on Women Anu, Pramila, Janet, Kelsey, Sophie, for bringing us together and organizing. Um, it feels like a, a good day, a good moment to be thinking about resistance and movements um, against oppression. Um, I'm going to read a passage from my book, Kuli Woman. Um, the book is, in one sense, a collective biography of a group of women, those who left India for British Guyana as semi-coerced plantation workers. The book is also personal history of indenture, and that's not only because my ancestors are all indentured, were all indentured, but also the book began very much as a uh, personal quest for identity. Um, I was really pushed forward by this profound need to answer the question, who, who am I, right? So I thought it might be useful as a prelude to reading from the book to tell you how I answer that question. Um, how I identify and how I don't identify might be helpful in thinking through strategies for dismantling caste in diaspora. Okay, so first and foremost, I see myself as Guyanese American. I answered a West Indian. And I'm also a Jersey girl um, on government forms and for solidarity's sake. I check boxes next to the term Asian American and if given the option, um, I specify that I'm South, South Asian. Um, I do embrace the hyphen in Indo-Caribbean. And I'm thinking tonight of the late Guyanese poet Rajkumari Singh, who before I was even born, wrote a little manifesto about the word kuli. In my world, it means something different than it does in the subcontinent, where a kuli carries bags and burdens at railway stations and elsewhere. In the context of empire and the system of labor that replaced slavery in the British Empire, kuli was the colonialist term for indentured laborer. Um, and over time, it became an ethnic, ethnic slur in the West Indies. But Rajkumari Singh wanted this stigma subverted and the word reclaimed. So she issued a call. 
Proclaim the word, the word, she wrote. Identify with the word. Proudly say to the world, I am a coolie. So I answered the call in my own way by writing the book that I did and giving it the title that I did, uh, Coolie Woman. Um, I am proud to say that I am a coolie. Um, here's how I, I don't identify. I don't, I don't identify by caste. Uh, it's not part of my nomenclature of self. My book reconstructs the journey of my great-grandmother Sujaria from India to Guyana. According to her emigration pass, she was Brahmin. Uh, she's the only one of my great-grandparents so identified by the British colonial administration. Another great-grandmother was born on an indenture vessel to parents uh, who were said to be Brahmins, uh, passing as Kshatriyas, one lower level lower in the caste hierarchy. That, in any case, is the, is the family lore. Um, so while tracking down emigration passes during research for my book, I discovered that the rest of my ancestors were classified as belonging to middle agricultural castes, or castes that would now be classified in India as other backward castes, or uh, to upper caste groups deemed below Brahmins. I had to actually look up most of the caste terms, uh, words that were mysterious to me then, such as ahir and kahar, uh, to figure out what they were. As a child immigrant in Jersey City, across the river, I, I didn't grow up formed by a caste identity. And I'd argue that this, this is largely because I'm a descendant of the system of indenture. Um, so I'm going to read a passage from Cooley Woman that begins to unpack the process of losing caste. This is from the fourth chapter, Into Dark Waters, which is uh, set at the depot in Calcutta where the indentured waited for ships to take them to new worlds. All right, so can you all hear me okay? Yeah. <laughs> One scholar of indenture has remarked that the British didn't recruit coolies for their sugarcane fields. They made coolies. By this logic, the system took gardeners, goldsmiths, cow miners, leather makers, boatmen, soldiers, and priests with century-old identities and turned them all into an indistinguishable, degraded mass of plantation laborers without caste or family. This process began at Garden Reach as the emigrants ate and slept side by side violating the taboos and rules that had so far governed their lives. When they first arrived, the immigrants were stripped of their own clothes and given soap to wash in the Hooghly River. Again, side by side, the concerns of caste seemingly disappearing down the river. Like the sacred thread that one migrant saw some high caste Hindus discard as they bathed in 1898. There was good reason for those men to let slip downriver the thread called the janeo. Brahmin boys receive it as part of their ritual initiation into manhood at the age of 13. Today, in a filigreed ring box kept with the family jewelry, my father's own janeo lies cushioned, tinted with turmeric used during his initiation rite in Guyana and countless other religious ceremonies since. Hidden away like that, a century after Sujaria may have watched men of her caste release their genales. It testifies to the secrets and strategies of Brahmin immigrants. They may have hidden their identities, but they didn't disavow them. The genale persisted across continents and generations. Brahmins probably knew they were unwanted. The word had gotten out Planters saw them as unfit for hard labor in the fields, and moreover as a potential threat to their authority. Those who abandoned the Janeo must have known it would betray them to government doctors, instructed to check for the soft, disqualifying hands of Brahmins. Depot officials, seeking to dispel the, the belief that indenture dishonored women, segregated them from men even when in line for food. One man who migrated in the early 1900s 
describe the sleeping arrangements at the depot this way. Bachelor man sleeping one side, woman sleeping one side, separate, separate. But another who stayed in the same depot for a month in 1906 said efforts to keep the sexes apart failed. In the depot, all ate together and people slept with each other's wives, he told a historian seven decades later. I did not like this behavior. There was no caste or religion there. The same memory troubled Munshi Raymond Khan, the indentured emigrant who witnessed the Janeos being discarded. He denounced the depot as a place where higher caste Hindus began to lose their religion. Though he was Muslim, this seemed to violate his own sense of the universe's order. Many decades later, he wrote, these people resorted to infidelity. They did not hesitate to have other women from different castes and creed to keep them company. They also were very close and intimate with the untouchables and ate, drank, and had fun with them and started relations with their women folk. Their company was therefore those very people who ate pigs, cows, etc., and they even impregnated their seeds in these women. Most men had left their own wives behind in their villages, and most women had left their husbands behind if they hadn't already lost them to famine, migration, or other women. The history books tell us that the uncoupled regularly became coupled at the depot out of convenience or necessity. Women perhaps calculated it would benefit, that it would help to have a protector on the journey ahead, and men may have seen the benefits of having someone to cook and care for them where they were going. New husbands and wives were regularly taken without ceremony or priestly sanction across caste and religion. I try to imagine my great grandmother in this setting preparing to board the Clyde in 1903. Had she found a protector too? Was he of her caste? In her week in the depot, did she see any men seed their sacred threads to the river? And if so, did that disturb her? Was Sujaria anxious about the 10,500 nautical miles ahead? Was she aware that the distance would be so great or that it would take three and a half months to sail from Calcutta to Georgetown? Had she ever been on a ship or heard about the Pagal Samundar, the point where two oceans meet at the Cape of Good Hope and where the waves rage against this meeting, churning up a mad sea? Did she view sea voyages as Hinduism's ancient books of right conduct, the Dharma Shastras did? Presumably because conditions on board thwarted ritual purity, the laws of Manu declared seafarers spiritually unfit. Judged polluted, along with thieves, perjurers, physicians, one-eyed men, black-toothed men, and inexplicable others, they were barred from eating with their kin, making offerings to their dead, or the gods, and receiving offerings once dead. Did it unnerve my great-grandmother to contemplate excommunication so complete it reached into the afterlife? Coming from the world she did, where community was life itself, she must have feared that the dark waters would swallow her very self and soul. Or could she see that the seven sins that led to the loss of caste all challenged the primacy of Brahmins in some way? and were therefore in their self-interest to sanction. Was she cowed or baffled by the atonement required to reclaim caste every day for three years, eat only one small meal, stand all day, sit all night, bathe thrice? If Sujaria doubted the punishment and the penance, she wasn't alone. In Bengal in the 1890s, the sea voyages movement peaked. Upper caste Hindus wanting to study in England argued that religious tradition allowed travel for merit, for education, progress, pilgrimage, as long as no polluting contact occurred. Did my great-grandmother also reject the notion that sea seafarers automatically lost caste? Or could she not care less? Was the female caste, so to speak, the only one with concrete meaning for her existence? So some of the other sins that led to a loss of caste according to the Dharma Shastra, uh, voyaging by sea, stealing a Brahmin's property, serving the lower castes, getting a lower caste woman pregnant with a son, 
and being the son of such a union. So I'd like to pick up on this idea of the female caste. Uh, that's a phrase spoken by a Dalit woman interviewed in the 2011 Anand Patwardhan film, the documentary Jai Bim Comrade. And I saw this documentary the year I started writing Kuli Woman, and it seemed to me a powerful way to capture the ways that gender and caste interacted in plantation societies during indenture. The phrase, the female caste, frames the power that indentured women possessed or, or lacked, and their ab ability to renegotiate power as well. Um, so just some of the historical background. And there were far fewer indentured women than men in all the colonies that recruited indentured laborers. Fewer than 30% of the indentured were women, and this meant that they had uh, some leverage in choosing new partners. Roughly two-thirds of the women who left India indentured were, like my great-grandmother, traveling without men at their sides. They formed new relationships on the sea voyages from India or when they arrived on the plantations. And um, overseers did sometimes assign women to men, but the women's shortage gave them some, the ability to leave men who disappointed or abused them. And it also enabled them to partner across caste. They could partner with someone of a higher caste, but many also partnered with someone of a lower caste. They had to. Immigration statistics suggest that most of the migrants declared high caste were women. Uh, the sugar colonies recruited many Brahmin women who were fleeing the misery and destitution of a widow's life in India. The custom against remarriage for, widow, for widows was especially enforced for upper caste women. Their ability to reinvent was constrained, and that might explain why two-thirds of the upper caste indentured laborers sent to Guyana in 1898 were women, two-thirds. Um, among high caste coolies, there was a shortage of men rather than women. My great-grandmother's life, once in Guyana, testifies to the ways that these demographic realities diminished the importance of caste. She found two new partners in Guyana. The first belonged to the landowning caste of Thakurs, and the second to the Ahir caste of cow minders and milk sellers. She ultimately settled with the cow minder, who had been the leader of a work gang on, the, on their plantation. So these sub-overseers, called drivers or sirdars, had privileges that made them attractive to women. The plantation had leveled everyone except drivers to the position of mere coolie, and drivers were not picked on the basis of caste. New hierarchies emerged across the dark waters. Women of all castes preferred and chose men able to help them endure and even escape the rigors of the plantation, regardless of caste. These also included men who'd been in the colony for the longest time because they tended to have the most money. Uh, some could even buy off a woman's indenture and set her free. The shortage of women, more than enabling them to ascend in caste, challenged the primacy of caste as a meaningful marker of status. The word dugla also testifies to the transformations of caste through, in, in post-slavery so societies throughout the Caribbean. Uh, so in Bojbri, the, the language spoken in, in the areas of India where most of the indenture come from, uh, Dagla means someone of mixed caste. In the Caribbean, the word evolved to mean someone of African and Indian origin. In both cases, it was a slur carrying the connotation of illegitimacy, but the basis of the slur had changed, right? So race, rather than caste, became the dividing line in Guyana, Trinidad, Jamaica, and other West Indian colonies with indentured Indian populations. Indenture caused tec tectonic shifts in power. It created a quote-unquote female caste with some leverage by virtue of their small numbers. This did leave them vulnerable to physical violence, but it also empowered them to some degree. Men who had been accustomed to authority based on their gender, caste, or family position were ousted. They could be on plantations, they confronted a system that flaunted, flaunted its total control over them. They could be imprisoned, they could be fined, they could be flogged, they could lose their women, either through those women's agency or through the workings of the plantation or the laws of the planter state. 
This loss of power led to a situation in indenture colonies where men committed suicide at greater rates than women, and uh, where upper caste men committed suicide at greater rates than lower caste men. This was the inverse of, of trends in India. The loss of caste may have provoked crises of meaning, particularly for the most powerful. And it's still a lingering ancestral memory for people descended from indenture. Indo-Caribbeans in the United States uh, wrestle, I would say, pretty intensely with identity. As people twice displaced who struggle to know who they are, there's a curiosity about caste backgrounds. Um, there's also, I would say, a wounded sense of being outcast as the subcontinent's outside children. And some fight against the notion of lost caste because it contributes to a fragile sense of self. I'd like to redirect this existential preoccupation with losing caste to what I hope might be more fertile ground. What did it mean that the Brahmins discarded their janeos in the river on leaving Calcutta? What does it mean that my father still possesses one? Was caste dismantled through indenture, or did it persist? And if it did persist, in what forms? I'm not a scholar of caste, well equipped to answer those questions. I'm just someone who comes from this history. And I claim that fact with pride. If I say with pride that I'm a kuli, I also say with pride that yes, I'm an outcast too. I want to say to people like me, look, you know, we did, we did lose caste by crossing the seas. We did lose caste by breaking rules about endogamy, by partnering constantly outside caste. I want to, take, I want to say, taking a cue from Rajkumari Singh, proclaim this with pride. Celebrate the loss of caste. Lean into it. Focus on the new world improvisations of our ancestors. They were flexible, practical people, capable of reinventing themselves. What lessons might their adaptations and the experience of indenture hold for the movements to dismantle caste in diaspora currently? I don't have answers, I only have questions. And these are just provisional thoughts that hopefully contribute in, in some way to movements against casteism. So I want to end by invoking a concept at the core of the indentured imaginary. Those who made the three-month crossing together in the bellies of boats called each other Jahaji Bai or Jahaji Bahan, uh, which means ship sister and ship brother. This was a particular intimate word to call out someone who'd made the journey on the same ship with you, whether they were Dalit or Brahmin. And it was passed down from one generation to the next. The indenture created new notions of family and extended family as a testament to surviving the crossing together and for the sake of further survival in a new world. This was a new kinship category and it transcended caste and religion. It did come out of a very particular experience of exploitation, but I wonder if it might offer a conceptual tool for, a 21st cent for the 21st century fight against caste discrimination in the US to see migration as possible freedom from caste. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I don't know how to follow that up now. That was beautiful. Thank you so much for that wonderful reflection. And it offers us so many ways to think about caste that we don't usually do. So thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm really thrilled to be standing here in front of all of you. My first time at Barnard for a conversation on caste, gender, and diaspora as part of the McIntyre Lecture Series. We're living through world-shaping times, although many would argue that we've been living through these times for a few decades now. For many of us, especially folks who are in our 20s and 30s, this is the only world we've ever known. As the famous Antonio Gramsci quote that has been making the rounds lately goes, the old world is dying. The new one struggles to be born. Now is the time of monsters. I'm sure in the past several weeks, as we bear witness 
to the world-sanctioned genocide in Gaza, amplified further by the attacks in Israel. Some of us perhaps are reeling from the punitive consequences of speaking about the gut-wrenching injustice as we see it, while some others are possibly coping with losing their friends, family, and community members, or the sense of safety and security they've always held on to. We all might have wondered throughout all this, what is even the point? I know I have. I've struggled to synthesize and make sense of the reality around us lately. And before we go into the details of the subject that we have gathered here to discuss today, I would like to acknowledge our collective anguish, confusion, and even the despair that we might be experiencing at this particular moment in our history. I would also like to start by saying that I have somewhat of a deep and personal relationship with despair, the kind of despair that comes from being punished for using your voice to speak truth to power. The forceful sting that comes like a whiplash from nowhere, always taking you by surprise, no matter how much you prepare yourself for it. The blinding rap on the knuckles that you receive when you disrupt the Jenga of carefully constructed narratives that have been placed into that specific sequence precisely to construct a world reality that shows certain versions of the truth while obscuring the others. I know this walloping bite of despair so intimately because I was born as a Dalit woman in one of the most backward states in India, in a family that was only one generation removed from a dehumanizing caste profession of cleaning toilets and human excrement that was foisted across on us across centuries. Even among Dalits, the almost 250 million people in India, along with many more in Nepal, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and Pakistan, who belong to the formerly untouchable castes, my family's caste was among the lowest and most reviled almost like in a more hated category of its own. So much so that when in undergraduate uh, school in Delhi, when some people discovered that I was Dalit, but not Bhangi, which is the specific name of my lower caste, I was almost relieved. I know despair well because my existence as anything outside of the narrow confines of how Dalit women and Bhangi women in particular are expected to lead their lives was a direct challenge, even an attack on the fortified and calcified order of caste. And let me tell you, standing here in front of you today, identifying and calling out casteism the way that I have experienced it, that is definitely not how a Dalit woman is expected to behave. By, the, by defying every confining expectation that was placed on me and so many other Dalit women, whether it was through our education, which in my case, my dad's father specifically told my mom not to waste money on, since according to him, educating girls in an English medium school was wasteful, or whether through my career choices as an author and a journalist, despite coming from background of poverty, or my decisions to not be silent, even if it meant speaking out against one of the most powerful institutions across the world. I have had countless close encounters with the hopelessness that takes over immediately after you've been successfully robbed of your voice, even if that is temporary. Most recently, I was punished for speaking out when my likeness was used without permission for a show on Amazon Prime called Made in Heaven. Some of you who are South Asian and perhaps even otherwise might have witnessed the relentless coordinated targeting I experienced every single day and even some nights for eight long weeks simply because I stood up to say that I should have been asked for permission before a character who had lived my life and was clearly identified as such by thousands of the viewers of the show was depicted on a global streaming service. I was targeted 
called names, abused and doxed. The filmmakers, the makers of the show, responded to my call for recognition with an acerbic statement that effectively declared my work as invalid. Anurag Kashyap, a famous Bollywood director with immense clout in global cinema and a deep and close friendship with the makers of the show, went on record to give seven different interviews where he used the terms narcissist, opportunistic, and liar, unprovoked, to describe me as a way of comment as a way to comment on the targeting that I was experiencing. And no one with any power or influence checked him on it for weeks. Coming Out as Dalit, my book, which won the Indian National Literary Award for Young Writers in 2021, was openly called reductive, basic, and not useful because it wasn't academic enough. Details from my book, were used to target my family. I was collectively bullied for using the words coming out and it's titled, and then I was outed as queer without my permission. And then I was told I was lying about my queerness because up until that point, I had not identified as queer in public. Not even the Indian queer community stood up to call out how violent this was, especially as it was being done by other queer people. This wasn't 50 or even 15 years ago. This happened five weeks ago in 2023, online on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. A petition that was eventually circulated in my support described it as a virtual public lynching, the likes of which had not been witnessed against a Dalit woman before. And the most surprising part of this a lot of this hate came from other Dalit people, many of whom with close contacts with the show's makers, with the makers of the show, including the Dalit filmmaker who had directed the episode, some others who disagreed with me as a Dalit woman, as somebody who refused to be told what to do, what to say, whom to support, and most importantly, because I was a Dalit woman, who refused to be controlled. I grew up hiding my caste until I revealed my caste identity in a viral Facebook note that was titled, Today I'm Coming Out as Dalit. I was told, especially by my mom, that our caste was so loathed that no one could ever find out that we were Bhangi. The name in itself, which is an abuse, considered so potent that the Indian constitution recognizes it as a slur punishable by law. So the only way for us to survive was through lying about it and passing as from a dominant caste whenever that was possible. This fabricated identity, which was, which was predicated on pretending to be from someone from a group with higher social status, that's a phenomena known as passing, which at one point in the United States was extremely common among black communities. That passing always left me second guessing about whether the discrimination that I had endured my entire life, and which I can clearly now see as being rooted in caste, whether that had anything to do with caste at all. I remember being so embarrassed and almost angry with my mom whenever she would comment on how someone's discriminatory behavior with us was because of a loathed caste status, thinking, why did she have to make everything about caste all the time? But as it often happens, it wasn't until many years later that I realized how right she was. It was about caste every single time. The thing about caste is, is that it's invisible. Unlike racial differences which largely operate through skin color, caste move, moves stealthily while simultaneously defining every interaction that takes place in the context of South Asian culture. In fact, it wouldn't be incorrect to say that a large part of what is defined as South Asian culture is caste culture. Evading identification, evading identification and recognition around how and when casteism operates sometimes even by dominant caste people who are actively practicing it, 
is a key characteristic of caste because that is just how endemic caste is to our cultural behavior. Even those who practice it often don't know that they're practicing caste. After a lifetime of hiding my caste, it took me a very long time to learn to accurately recognize and identify how commonly it was happening all around me. It took me even longer to understand the actual scale of dehumanization and injustice that comes embedded into the inequality that is so easily justified as a given in our existence as Dalit people. And I had to wait yet some more before I could gather the strength and courage to be mad about all of this. What I talked about here is fairly traumatizing, and I'm sure you're wondering how I coped with the weeks of abuse I mentioned just a couple of minutes ago. The abuse that is so fresh in my body that I still get nauseous while checking my Twitter mentions. My core braces itself for yet another torrential round of abuse that almost always feels like a sock in the gut. The truth is I probably didn't. What I'm doing here in front of all of you is processing in real time the trauma of being punished for using my voice as a Dalit woman. As seasons transitioned through the weeks of August, September, and early October, just a couple of weeks ago, I remained stuck in grief, trauma, and disbelief that despite achieving the level of recognition that allows me to stand here in front of you today, I could still be attacked with the vicious and hateful bitterness from a lynch, war, from a lynch mob that no one seemed powerful enough to stop. Not to mention, it all happened as I lay huddled in my tiny apartment in Brooklyn, where the distance from India or shallow claims of how caste doesn't exist in the United States did little to detract people who were set to punish and destroy me for speaking up. I had mistakenly assumed that my public identity would be enough to offer me some protection. But what I had yet to realize that it was precisely my ability to use my voice in public that had led to the murderous intensity of this blowback. I had expressed not even anger, but merely disappointment for not being rightfully credited for the events of my own life, events that took me overcoming a lifetime of shame and trauma to admit in public in front of all of you. Like saying Bhangi, saying Bhangi, the much loathed name of my caste, which made my shoulders shiver to even say out loud, not until too long ago. Or admitting a stage, admitting on a stage, not unlike this one, the one secret that my mother had spent all her life hiding, that my grandmother cleaned toilets. The words that the Dalit woman author on the show on Amazon Prime spoke while describing a book she had written on coming out as Dalit at a fictional event at Columbia, those words were mine. <laughs> but my name was nowhere in it. All I had done was to stand up and ask why. And therefore, I was to be taught a lesson so brutal that no other Dalit person, especially no other Dalit woman, could ever dare to question why they weren't more grateful for their own erasure and the crumbs of inclusion that were being thrown our way so the establishment can simultaneously earn woke points while also never having to include our actual voices. It wasn't lost on me that in the backdrop of this personal yet extremely public virtual lynching I was experiencing that had spread across India, the South Asian diaspora in the UK, the US, Australia, there was a much wider battle of caste rights that was underway in this country. In February, Seattle had become the first city in the US to outlaw caste discrimination. And after months of intense organizing and clearing through various rungs of state legislature, the caste discrimination bill in the state of California was stuck in the office of the Democratic California governor, Gavin Newsom. Just a few weeks earlier, 
before this, the bill had undergone some massive changes, where the Hindu right-wing organizations had successfully pressured Democratic senators to remove caste as a standalone category and instead move it under the larger label of ancestry. This particular <coughs> moving was also the reason that Governor Newsom cited to not pass the bill and instead send it back as a veto, denying California the chance to become the first state in the country to ban caste discrimination. It was a huge letdown, especially for thousands of Dalit Americans who had spun, spent months organizing for it. But beyond the obvious reasons of deep pockets and endless resources of the Hindu right, which claims that Dalits having protection from discrimination somehow infringes on their freedoms, this was also an attempt to silence Dalits from shattering the narrative of model minority that Indian Americans in particular often use to define their identity in this country. The despair that follows the punitive sting lashed out at you precisely because you touched a bruised nerve of a powerful structure. That sting can be brutal, and just easily it can turn into dread. I've had days when I could barely function, and evenings when I sat alone dealing with extremely dark thoughts. I even wondered if I would be better suited working as a project manager at a tech startup, and if I should go back into hiding the way I was before I came out as Dalit to the world in 2016. Even as I'm writing this now, which was a couple of days ago, I still don't know how I can move on from this. But I do know one thing. I can't go back. My voice and my words, which I have paid such a huge cost to own, are all that I have. Yes, they can lash out. And they, they, th they can think that they have got us down. But in the iconic words of the great Maya Angelou, you may shoot me with your words, you may cut me with your eyes, you may kill me with your hatefulness, but still, like air, I rise. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, we're supposed to have a collective conversation before opening it up to the audience. Um, I think there's so much to say and so many of you here that I will keep my engagements and um, comments very, very brief. Uh, this is a very tough act to follow, indeed. Thank you both. Um, I think I want to just start with a couple of, of um, broad thoughts. And, and this really comes up in terms of thinking about caste as both old and new, and something that I think both of you have brought up. That caste is both, um, you know, in the way that B. Adam Bedkar talks about it, the, the structure of caste is, is complex because it's both an anachronism and a remnant from another time, but one that's also capable of constantly innovating, morphing, transforming, and becoming something else. And this is the hydra-headed structure of caste and what happens to it both historically and as it moves temporally, uh, spatially, right? And so the question of what is caste, where is it, what happens to it, and how, um, I think is, is a complex both historical question, but it's also a deeply existential and an ethical one, not to mention one with tremendous political consequence, right? Um, the entire history, if you will, of the 20th um, century uh, is a struggle to rethink caste and to remake it as something else that's capable of um, providing a model of justice rather than the millennial injustice, I think, Yashika, that you were speaking to. Um, so there's just a couple of things that come up uh, in terms of connecting what both of you have been um, saying. One, it seems to me, is the question of names, naming, and renaming. 
and the tremendous significance of, of that. So Gayutra, for you, the, and for both of you, the term, and forgive me, but I will use that term, the term bhangi and the term kuli, the C word, the B word, the D word, uh, this is enormously potent and powerful, right? Because what it carries is a history of enormous degradation, discrimination, and exclusion, but it's also the place from which um, you come into uh, you come into a, a certain kind of knowledge, and I think I want to ask you what that knowledge really is. So, what does it mean to think about both hiding caste, coming out, and connecting in so many different ways with this hurtful term and word, which is actually covered by laws against caste atrocity today, right, as you brought up. So there's something about kind of renaming and resignification, both the C word, but I think what you open up in terms of the new possibilities, what you call new world improvisations. So both of you bring up the question of kind of naming, renaming, and resignifying social structures, identities, and experiences around the name. I think I just want to ask you both what, what, what is contained in that name? What does it mean to kind of both materialize and to dematerialize some of these terms and names and categories? Um, what can be said? Who can say it? And what can't be said? And where? And those are, I think, profound questions as well about not just the name, but the fact that the name establishes a relationship. And it establishes a structure of intimacy and of agonistic intimacy that one wants to think with. So one, I think just broadly, if you could think a little bit about the name. The second, I guess, is the question of method for both of you that I wanted to ask you about. Um, and this, to my mind, and Gayathra, having read um, a great deal of your work and being a, an enormous admirer, I think, of your writing, I want to sort of ask you about the relationship between history and memory and trauma. And I guess I wanted to ask you whether you could speak to this as a writer, as a question of formalism and style, but also of pacing, right? The ways in which you use the archive and the ways in which you think about narrative and time um, is something that I'd really like to hear you say a little bit more about. Because I think you're someone who uses, you're a better historian than most of us. <laughs> but I know that's not you know, the mode and the world that you identify with. And so what are the affordances of the archive, but also what is the reach beyond it? Sort of qu questions around critical fabulation, around narrative, and the kind of different temporalities of history, memory, and perhaps trauma, what can and cannot be said um, for you in terms of your own writing. And I think, Yashika, in terms of what you presented today, there's something very interesting um, in, in the ways you talk about the psychic life of caste, right? Um, one could think about Fanon. <laughs> one could think about the, um, the bad object, right? Psychically, the kind of bad object that is the um, object that kind of takes on the poison. And much of what you were speaking about today is about the question of kind of self-formation and making and remaking by thinking through the psychic order of caste, both as a certain kind of maybe corporeal schema, I don't know um, if that drives for you, but what is happening in terms of the ways that you're thinking about writing? And I guess very simply speaking, the relationship between the public and the private and what it means to kind of create a certain kind of life um, and, a, and a kind of psychic self, which I think you spoke a great deal about um, today. So maybe with that, and then we can open up to others. You're looking at me. <laughs> wow. I <laughs> Yeah, These I mean, you really broad, broad comments as well. and, and, and such a, a deep consideration of the work. Thank, thank you so much. I think you probably know it almost better than I do. But, um, you know, I, I mentioned in my opening remarks that 
that I was pushed forward by the question, who am I, right? As um, you know, a Guyanese American growing up uh, in New Jersey um, and being sort of uh, mistaken for someone of many different backgrounds, Puerto Rican sometimes, sometimes, sometimes Indian, right? Um, yes, the book was about that, but since you ask about trauma and history, it started there, right? It started with that question of I identity. Um, but uh, when I went to the archives, um, I sort of accidentally discovered <laughs> that it was, it was a much deeper, much deeper, profound um, question about, about gender-based violence. Um, and uh, what, I, what I had seen, uh, you know, um, in my own family and extended family and community uh, growing up, um, you know, as, as normal ways to, to, treat, to treat mothers and, um, you know, sisters and cousins. Um, and that, that was a very hard thing for me to grapple with. It, it's um, still hard to talk about that in public spaces, um, and that really is, when you ask about writing and the role of writing and history, um, it, the archives forced me to contend with what I was uh, avoiding uh, on a personal level, um, and even in the writing of it, you, you can see me kind of skirt <laughs> and run away from time to time, like not wanting to look at it. Uh, square, squarely, um, but, you know, 10 years later, 10 years after publication, um, I would say that the, the process of, of writing this book was, was essential not only for myself, but uh, also maybe gave permission to the many other people, women, young women like myself who've seen the same things unfold in their own in their own lives, um, so so, the, so it's the kind of porosity of of violence and desire that structures the particular experience of indenture. Um, in in particular, that yeah, becomes so, the kind of knot that you have to unravel or right, right. So um, I, I mentioned I, I talked a, a bit about the leverage that the shortage of women gave, gave to indentured women. Um, but when they exercised that leverage, there was a, a violent reaction to it um, and um, some really spectacular violence, um, violence as spectacle across all of the sites of indenture. Um, and the, the cutlass, the machete, the tool from the cane field was turned against women who um, chose to reject men, right? Um, and so I trace that to current uh, violence against women in, in diaspora and, uh, and also in Guyana and, and Trinidad. Um, so um, you asked about, about pacing. Um, mm -hmm. I, I build to a, a chapter called Surviving History, right? And I think that... Um, <laughs> the avoidance of I mean, in the in there are two yeah. chapters that deal with the violence head on and and they they were the most difficult chapters to write, but um, it le it all leads the narrative leads to to this final question of uh, of of surviving history and how how that happens, um, and uh, it, it happens through the strength of the women involved, right, and um, again again their agency. Mm -hmm. Right, um, so um, I, I don't know if that answers yeah, the no, question. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, and the thing that I wanted to hear you say a little bit more about is what you ended with, the, the caste-race connection and the ways that that is both remaking and unmaking, as you say, caste, but putting in place new sorts of um, divides and boundaries. but. How do we think about, because indenture in particular is a place where caste and race meet, right? As kind of social analytics and categories. And I just wanted to hear you say a little bit about that as well in this context. Right, so um, 
I talked about how I, I didn't really have a caste identity growing up. I wasn't really aware mm -hmm. of, of a caste identity, despite, <laughs> despite the Janelle. But I was very aware of a, um, a, ra a racialized identity, and um, that has a great deal to do with the, the 20th century Cold War politics of, of Guyana, which I won't get into too very deeply. But um, there is a, a long history of tension between descendants of the enslaved and descendants mm -hmm. of the indentured throughout the Caribbean. Um, and some of the conversation around that was framed in caste terms. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, um, mm -hmm. in some of the colonial narratives, um, the conversation was about how black people were seen as, as untouchable. Mm -hmm. um, and, and a lot of the taboo about interracial relationships, what was based in that. Um, and I, I think that yeah. there, there is validity in that. Mm -hmm. um, it's much more complex. Um, it has also to do, of course, with, with the, the systems of indenture mm -hmm. and slavery and the ways that uh, the British colonial state worked to, to rule by dividing, right? Um, and again, what happened in the 20th century with US intervention. But um, I, I also think that, I mean, it, it's, it's the basis for, I mean, understanding that history is the basis for solidarity, right? Um, Afro-Asian solidarity, not only in the Caribbean, but in the United States in communities descended from indenture and descended from, from slavery. Um, because it, it's fundamentally about an awareness of how uh, the colonial state engineered these divisions. Um, and colonial writers talked about, you, you know, how Indians are racist because they're casteist, right? When, when you know, there, there's a far deeper analysis that could be, could be done there. Yeah, um, I'll start with the first question about the B word. Um, you know, the way I think of it is, and I'm only going to speak for myself and personally how I've arrived at this. Um, the word bhangi carried so much shame in my, in my, during my entire life. Like my, my parents and my family wouldn't even say the word. And I remember in conversations if, my mom had to say, oh, we are bhangi. Like, it would drop a register because there was so much shame that we couldn't even afford a fly on the wall to hear us admit that about ourselves. So in terms of how I experience and the journey of this word as it lives inside me is more to do with ownership of power. And Dalit people in India across the subcontinent Dalit women in particular, and especially people from the lowest of the low castes, um, Bhangi people um, in particular, and Dome people who are uh, the cast of disposing dead bodies, all these dehumanizing uh, and disenfranchised professions, um, our identities become this word. The word Bhangi is who we are. It's not what we do. It's, it, the word Bhangi is description of a person who cleans toilets. It's not somebody, who, it's not a description of the work. So it becomes us, the work, the, the cleaning of the excrement becomes us. And when that much trauma and generational trauma and shame and um, fear and powerlessness is embodied into this one single word, I want us to think about what it means for somebody who is at the center of this, somebody like myself or other millions of Bhangi people across the world, what does it mean for them to say this word out loud in spaces that are non-Dalit or mixed mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. international? And what is it, that word signifies the journey of the power that we are claiming for ourselves because Dalits have been rendered so extremely powerless in our societies, Bhangis in particular, that just saying this gives us a sense of control and reclaiming some 
worth that has been robbed from us. So in terms of who can say it and who doesn't say it, I mean, let's be honest, we know how India works. Constitutionally, it's a slur, but we still, in gathering, say, don't behave like a bhangi. Why are you dressed like a bhangi? You know, and people use it as a pejorative. It's been used in my presence hundreds of times, people not realizing I'm the bhangi in the midst. I'm the one they're talking about. So, you know, us saying, stop saying this word is not going to change anything. I think what personally I want to claim is my power back and the power back for so many of us and say that your words do not sting us. They do not define who we are. And what you think of being as somebody being bhangi is not what it means for us. You, you're not allowed to define my worth anymore. And that's what the word means, especially for me. So, so um, that's the first part and and I like when this whole thing happened I had to give a ton of interviews and you know um, the media was all over it and they kept has I saw the journalist hesitating hesitating while saying the word they were like can we say bhangi and I'm like well you decide do you want to say it and how do you want to say this word what are you what are you communicating while saying the word bhangi are you using it as a slur against me are you using it in solidarity? And these are like complex issues. They can't be fought on Twitter. They can't be fought online. I think the, these are um, ideas that will take a long time. And this is such a specific subset of conversation that we're having in this particular room in New York, right? But like outside, there's a completely different reality. So I think the ideas germinate and they can spread. But for me, Bhangi is reclaiming our power back, so. Um. The second part yeah, of the question. We'll up, yeah. yeah, I mean, I'll quickly answer that when you, when you talked about uh, the psychic world of caste, and that's such an interesting way to look at it because caste, the way I look at it, the entire world of caste is psychic. The entire world operates um, in a way that everybody knows what's going on, but we don't have the vocabulary to identify it. These rituals, these customs that are so embedded in our cultural bones, we cannot identify them as caste. And that, for me, is the psychic hidden world of caste. The few things that we understand as caste, you know, untouchability, not allowing Dalits into your homes, not serving them in the same dishes, active discrimination, these are manifest you know, ideas that you can see. There's so much about caste that you cannot see, that you cannot identify. And my job as a writer and a journalist, you know, when you talked about what's left on the page, is to show you what caste is about. And I think that was the purpose of my book, Coming Out as Dalit, is to show you how caste runs everything in South Asian societies, anything that you can think of is related to caste, has caste behind it. And for me is to make the invisible visible. And that's my goal when I'm on page. So that's about it. Thank you. I, we have, um, I think we've got maybe 15 um, to 20 minutes. If I could maybe collect some questions to give um, you all a chance to speak and ask questions. Do you mind if we take about three or four? Questions at a go, if you could keep questions brief, but please jump in. There's a, there's a hand here, and there's one here. Hi, um, my name is Tanisha. I'm a sophomore at Barnard. Um, I'm also from Fremont, which is um, the city where the SB 403, the anti-caste bill, came out. Um, and I was part of Aisha Wahab's team that lobbied for the bill. Um, and my question was, you know, there's been a lot of people in my community who say that an anti-caste bill is bad because it's going to dredge up issues that eventually lead to anti-Indian, anti-Hindu, anti-South Asian, all of these like racist, bad things. So how do you sort of like respond to a claim that, oh, if we point out issues within our community, that'll leave room for everyone outside of it to come and critique it and then turn that into a whole racist issue? Of anyone, sure, but um, I know you mentioned the bill, so. <laughs> yeah. Um, hey, hang on, for, we'll, sure. we'll, collect, we'll collect a few so that we can hear from 
the audience. There's a question here, I think, yeah. Thank you both. My name is Nikhil. I am a PhD student in Princeton. I'm also an anti-caste literary translator from Hindi to English. Um, thank you both for such an inspiring uh, talk. Thank you, Anu, for your questions and provocations. My question is actually related to what you were asking about the uh, plurality, if you will, of castes and casteisms, where at one end it ties in with racialization, at another end it ties in with um, other kinds of transcreations of caste. Uh, Gayatra, with your talk, I was thinking that the, the equivalence that we're making between caste that is lost, the Indian caste, so to speak, that is lost in transit, how does that square up with the, ca the forms of caste privilege that are gained or negotiated, right? So what, what is happening to caste as an object um, or as a, as a form of life? And then with Yashika's talk also, the kinds of casteisms within lower caste you know, life worlds, I was wondering if you could speak to the pl pluralities of castes in the room and the intractability of then coming up with an anti-caste sensibility uh, to those. Do you want to maybe take one? Please, there's, there's a question here, and maybe, maybe we can take both of those. And Hi, uh, my name is Bhavya. I am a student of social design at School of Visual Arts in Lower Manhattan. I come from Haryana, from a very small village, and I also belong from the same community as you do, Yashika. Uh, your, your speech was really heart-wrenching and heartwarming at the same time. It resonated a lot. So my question here is, whatever we do, like our research, our writing work, it's often discredited and often stated as it's not enough. Where are the stats? And stats are required to make a policy or a social change. How do we combat? Do we just ignore and keep on doing our work? Or how much research is enough research? <laughs> <laughs> you stay here at this college. There's one final question here, I think, and then we'll, we'll allow you. My question to you was just a curiosity about, well, when people got to Guyana, and you, I, I'm not sure which one of you was saying that uh, caste was such a big part of culture that it was culture. Mm. So then when uh, people got to Guyana or to Trinidad, and there was this dismantling of caste there, what then became of their own like Haitian and South Asian cultures? Like, how did they go on to like create that for themselves really? Because um, I know like, for example, like black people who were coming from Africa to uh, America or wherever they were going, um, ended up having to, they kept some of their culture, but a lot of their, like a lot of black American culture is wildly different from West Africa. So I was just curious about like how that kind of was happening. Um, but then for you, um, I was also curious because you were talking about um, passing, but then I also know that you mentioned being queer. So like, I guess I don't have a fully formulated question, but it was just a curiosity about what the process is like for you of navigating yeah. these different ways of passing, like whether it be passing uh, as being, I don't know, straight or passing as being, uh, you know, someone of a different caste, mm -hmm. and what that what that's kind of like for you over the course of your life, knowing that you have something that could actually drastically change the way that people interact with you just oh. in a moment of mentioning. Mm -hmm. so. both respond briefly. We might have time to take a few more questions another round. So please. Um. So Yashika, I want someone to do what you have done for the Caribbean uh, and write the book that makes um, what is invisible visible. Um, because I don't think that work has been written yet. And your, your question, um, it exposes it. Really, you ask how it, how was culture preserved? Um, 
speaking from my lived experience. <laughs> it was preserved um, in a few different ways, but probably primarily through religion. And my, my earliest memories are of my mother singing bhajans um, uh, in, in such a deeply beautiful way. And, and uh, um, it, for her, it clearly gave her an anchor. Um, and, and she wasn't, she isn't, you know, like always, um, she, she doesn't know what she's saying literally, but, but there's a knowledge there that, it, that mm -hmm. is emotional and real and valid. Um, you know, I mean, so <laughs> I talk about tensions that, in the Caribbean that replace those other divisions and systems of oppression. Um, but clearly my father, you know, he has that genel. He, uh, he, he, he will, if you ask him, he will say that he's Brahmin. And I think that this speaks to your question as well, Anikil. Um, uh, but I once asked him, you know, like, what does that mean to you? What does this jane, what does this mean to you? Um, that you've had it for almost 60 years now and you keep it in a treasured place. And he said, well, actually, I lost it when we came to the U.S. and I had to to get another one and have a Pandit bless it. But, but the more meaningful response was, you know, I don't think caste is something that you get because of birth or bloodlines. Mm -hmm. That's what he said to me. I think that caste, caste is something that you earn, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is not the right way to speak. I mean, but it's his way of speaking about it is that um, through devotion, through the depth of feeling in your worship, through right conduct, anyone can be a Brahmin. That's what he said to me. And that's maybe a particularly Caribbean way of understanding caste. Um, and it's actually rooted in uh, Vaishnavism, which is a particular um, form of Hinduism that was practiced in the areas that indentured folks came from. There's a 16th century saint, Chaitanya, who, who um, you know, preached that caste was not inherited, but um, again, like something that you could define for yourself. Um, so caste is still, it still exists in, in the Caribbean and in uh, Caribbean diasporic communities. In which ways it, it still exists is complex for me. Um, again, like I say, I didn't, I didn't grow up with a sense of myself as having a caste identity. I come from a mixed caste background. But surely there are ways <laughs> that, uh, that my family over the generations must have, must have benefited. There must have been privileges that, that we had. Um, and I know my grandfather who was born on the, on the ship from, from India to Guyana, he was a founder of a temple in, in, our, in our village. Um, and I, I don't have the, the answers to that. I want someone mm -hmm. to make visible what is in, invisible. Yeah, there were a couple of questions that were asked. Uh, the Fremont question, I think there has been more than enough literature that has been written about why us simply naming our oppression is not anti-Hindu. Um, if it is anti-Hindu, then maybe people who do subscribe to that idea of Hinduism should question what Hinduism means. Um, so, and uh, what was your name? Tanisha, um, I encourage you to look at the abundance of literature that's available um, where people have taken a lot of time to explain why oppressed people talking about their oppression does not harm the oppressor. So that's all I'll say about that. Um, your question, Bhavya? Yeah, um, thank you for being here. I, I know how hard it is to be from somebody from our shared background and to make this journey to the United States. Couldn't have been easy. Um, how much research is enough research? If you listen to what people will ask you, no research is enough research, they will keep they will kill you with asking for proofs. You know, and I'm a journalist. We, this is our job. But, you know, um, I think I can just offer you, when I was writing Coming Out as Dalit, um, 
I was very motivated by the idea that I don't want to write just an autobiography because I understand how Dalit lives and trauma and pain are easily dismissed. There was this idea when I was writing the book that you know Dalit people just write about pain. All their lives are filled with pain and sure, they can make anything up. Who's going to believe them? So what I did with the book was really go into statistics, really go into the research. And if you have the chance to pick the book up, you'll see that every personal experience is undergirded by a lot of statistical, empirical research. And that was precisely for that reason, because I wanted that book to not be questioned, that this is just your lived experience, who cares? Um, but you know, when you're making those decisions for yourself, I would encourage you to look at your own worldview, look at the field that you're in, provide as much as you need to, but really, if you follow the lens of what people ask you to do, it's just never going to end. So, yeah. Um, Nico, I think you asked a really important question. Thank you for bringing that up the different kind of casteisms that are in the room. That's such a beautiful way to put that because that is a reality that we don't talk about that. In India, there is a collective Dalit movement, but what we often fail to mention is that those Dalit people are themselves divided in many subcastes. Ambedkar talked about a descending order of contempt and that means that the further lower you go, the more the contempt rises. And I think this is very important for us to acknowledge as we move into our conversations with castes to see how caste impacts us also. We are not above giving into these ideas of hierarchy. And also, we're not magical beings. We're not pure by the virtue of just being Dalit. That doesn't give us a higher status or purer status, you know, though the word Harijan does connote that, that, you know, they are simple, pure beings. Harijan for non-South Asian folks is a word that was given by Gandhi to describe Dalits as, as uh, children of God. And the reason he described us as children of God so that we could forever be deemed as innocent, people who don't have agencies, people who, for whom decisions can be taken for instead of them taking their own decisions for themselves. So I really resist this idea of um, Dalits being defined as a pure or good inherently. I think we are all flawed human beings, but we must resist hierarchical nature that exists even within our communities. And, um, just have solidarity because I'm Bhangi, but I'm sure if I talk to Adivasi folks, they have, in the, on the scale of contempt, they're probably lower than I am. So I think that awareness is uh, really important for us to have. Yeah, and uh, I think the question that you asked was, Goitra uh, did a terrific job, but you know, in terms of passing, um, I've written about this extensively. One of the ways that Dalits can pass is by changing our last names. So the word, my last name, Dat, is an upper caste name. And a lot of people have said, why hasn't she changed her name yet? Because that has become a part of who I am, and that's why I've not changed back to my old caste name. But my caste name is Nadania, which has been hidden and concealed, and we never talked about it in school, graduation, Nobody was allowed to say, like in my family, we weren't allowed to talk about what our real caste name was. The cultural practices that you talked about, you know, the, the bhajans, the hymns, the religious hymns. In our family, we didn't know any of that. So my mother sent me to boarding school. And one of the reasons was that I could learn how these upper caste girls practice Hinduism. You know, what are, what are the words? I didn't know, the, one of the very famous hymns is Om Jai Jagdi Shari, which is in the northern part of the country. I didn't know the words, and I remember being like seven or eight years old in a boarding school, and people were like, how do you not know this? Mm -hmm. And I couldn't tell them, it's because I'm from a lower caste. We don't have this culture. So there are many ways of um, learning, but it, it is, I, I would like to tell you, it is a very distinct culture that exists, that exists outside uh, within separate castes, and um, it is gatekept. It is actively gatekept. It is, you know, recipes. Brahmin people, uh, Brahmin households, are very protective of their food culture. Mm -hmm. It's because they want to preserve it as being a marker of caste purity. So it's just one of the ways that 
culture travels. I hope that answers. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. We're at nine. Can we? Do you want to take a round of comments? Would Would you like to just? Oh, maybe. Final comments, yes. Yeah. I yeah. mean, th that is to have yeah. people ask a final set of yeah. questions yeah. or comments, and maybe you don't respond, but just. Listen, just to give people a chance to speak. Could I, if they had more questions. Could I say just one last Please? quick yeah. thing? Um, and I'm hesitant because I, I, I want to leave it with, with Yashika and your amazing voice and, and testimony. Did you say it was Om Jai Jagadish Re? So, okay, so that's the one bhajan I learned as a child. <laughs> but um, just to, to, to speak to the, the multiple casteisms, I feel like. Um, I have to say that it's it, what a, what a paradox it is to be a Brahmin Kuli, right? I mean, I didn't, I didn't. What I did know about myself growing up all the time was that my grandfather was a sugarcane cutter, and my grandmother worked as a weeder on a plantation. So, I mean, those were the facts of their existence. But at the same time, my mama taught me Om Jai Jai Shahari. Final, final comments, yes. Hey, fellow Kuli Gal over here. Um, proudly reclaiming it as well. Um, I'm wondering, you know, in uh, Guyanese as well, um, you know, in Guyana, we eat dal and rice every day. We sing Om Jai Jagadish all that stuff, right? Um, but we don't necessarily have a real connection to India. And so I'm wondering, and maybe you know where I'm going with this already, is that you know what like what role do we have to play in solidarity between the two but also what role do we have to play in taking some shit down like because like we've already done the work of dismantling a lot of Every that role. yeah and so like what is our role then in our connection to the so-called motherland or the homeland while still maintaining that double diasporic identity that has allowed us to free ourselves oh. in so many ways. Hi. Um, actually, I'll just follow up on all the comments that has been made. Uh, I'm a new student. I'm an MBA student at Columbia Business School, and uh, the lit is back from India. So, <laughs> just to talk about invisibility. The time when I was coming over here to pursue my MBA, my father did tell me, "You want to change your surname?" Like he. He offered that, so just to add on the layer of that invisibility to fit in to the culture and the identity of what a business school student is, right? Um, yeah. Um, just to follow up on like this comment, right? If you can uh, talk about castelessness and anti-caste uh, like support that we can do either in Ghanaian society or even in US. Yeah, thank you. My name is Vikas. I'm from Teachers College, a second year student, master student in education, and also uh, uh, coming from Ambedkarite, scheduled caste, uh, categorized in constitution. Uh, so following both the beautiful uh, words, actually the narrations, what I learn and unlearn, I think, uh, and also her question is very important here in like spending two and a half, one and a half year in New in Colombia and near uh, New York, I feel uh, especially uh, you said like immigration might be the uh, uh, immigration might helps to uh, annihilate the caste, right? So I feel, and you gave the statistics as well, but I feel like the majority of people, if they are from upper caste, so how we will break the immigration, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Then I feel. Uh, we need to support students from different caste categories, like whosoever is saying that I'm from Dalit or I'm from Adivasis or from OBCs category, they are very few in number. So I feel how we can help them to come here and give them uh, opportunity or spreading the word. And second thing I feel like as a student, uh, because there are majority upper caste and other uh, people from India, and the celebration, the culture is happening here. Like now we have Diwali celebration and everyone, South Asian people call to, on that, uh, celebrating the Diwali, but no one calls to celebrate different like Ambedkar Jayanti and other festivals, right? So I think we should also 
because uh, I I face the same. Because I am a senate member in Teachers College as well, and they everyone is saying we should celebrate Diwali. I said yes, we should celebrate Diwali, but also we sh should celebrate Ambedkar Jayanti as well because I am a Dalit and I see that. We should, and Ambedkar studied in Colombia, we should have a celebration of um, in, uh, in the name of Ambedkar. But there was pin dropped silence. No one want to, no one want to uh, take that initiative or want to talk about it. And all people are from upper caste. So I think uh, we should consider uh, the culture celebrations from downtrodden communities as well. Thank you. Really Maybe we can, we can, final yeah, um, final thoughts from both of you. So you, you both have the last word. You, uh, can, you can say two words. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you know, especially these final comments, I feel educated and my role is to continue to be educated. Yeah, I, I would like to add to that and thank you all of you, because, you know, um, for your comments, and you as well. I was very struck by Quetra's reading, and when she said, you know, um, when they moved, when they crossed the Kalapani in the Black Seas, caste was lost in, in some ways. And maybe, for me, I see it as a possibility of hope that not just through immigration, but there is, you know, the, the idea of Brahmins giving up Janeu it's so fantastical to me, coming from India, just that Brahmins would willingly give up the privilege that, that defines their entire life. So I would, I would, what I'm taking from this conversation is an immense amount of hope that it has been done and it can be done again. So let's just all work towards that. Thank you. Thank you all very, very much for coming. Um, I'm immensely grateful to Yashika and to Gayutra. I knew this was going to be a good conversation. We needed, you know, another hour or two, I think, to really get into it. But thank you all very, very much for coming. I also want to go back to what you started with. I think we are in the middle of a great, great transformation. And we all have to decide how we are going to live with ourselves. And uh, that's the challenge of our time. So thank you all.